with, especially with the priority lectures. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what it means to be a leader as a nurse. Okay, so we're going to look at ways to delegate, what delegation means, and why it is necessary for us to be able to delegate, know how to delegate, who we can delegate to. Also talk about team building process and identify behaviors that will strengthen our team other than, ten, you know, pointing a finger at somebody and you did that wrong, you know, you don't know what you're doing. There's different ways to solve conflict and that's not one of them. And then we're going to talk about um, the importance of collabor collaboration across all medical professionals. Because y'all are going to be collaborating on a daily basis. If you don't collaborate on a daily basis, you're not doing your job. All right, so what is a healthcare team? So a team, we know what a team is, it's composed of a group of people who have a main goal. Well, teams in healthcare, the main goal is to take care of the patient and get them out of the hospital, right? That's our goal. Get them out of the hospital to where they can function on their own and go on with their lives. We as nurses cannot do everything that can um, we cannot do everything that will prepare the patient for discharge. We cannot do everything that's going to keep the patient um, breathing the most effectively. There's a respiratory therapist for that. We cannot be the one who solely can look at a patient's diet and say, well, with this disease process, this is what you should be eating. We learn that in school. We can look at our little med search books and pretty much come up if you have hypertension, you know, no salt, you got diabetes, no sugar. But there are nutritionists for that. Okay? Um, we cannot determine if a patient is going to be able to walk throughout their house, walk up their stairs, get into their shower. We can see how their gait is and how strong they are. From getting from the bed to the bathroom or getting from the bed to the chair but that's why you have physical therapists and occupational therapists if you have a patient who your questioning could be aspirated you go into the room and they're asking for something to drink and you give them a sip of water or something and they start coughing and you're like wait wait a minute are you aspirating there's speech therapy for that so for us to be able to take care of our patients to provide the best outcome for them, you need to know who your team is, all right? You need to know who you can call. You need to know who is reliable. You need to know who you can trust. Because I hate to say this, not everybody does their job like they're supposed to. <laughs> um, even down to the CAT scan technicians, the MRI technicians, you know, all those people play a huge role in healthcare in taking care of patients. The big thing with respect, trust, and as a team starts with you. You're going to deal with some main, hateful people. You know, the saying is whatever is going on at your house. You leave it at the door when you walk into the hospital, and whatever's going on at the hospital, you leave it at the door whenever you go into your house. That is easier said than done. Trust me, I know I've done it for a long time. But that's what you have to do. I also have to tell myself a lot of times, I'm not here to make friends, okay? I'm here to take care of patients. So not everybody's going to treat me like I'm going to treat other people, but guess what? I'm still going to treat you that way. I'm still going to be the one that's going to bring cookies in on Valentine's Day. I'm still going to be the one that's going to be going around seeing all my patients and smiling and happy. Going in and checking on my people. That's just my personality. That not everybody's like that. But y'all, you have to think about maybe what's going on in their lives. So you want to make sure that you respect everyone. So you have to think about it all the time. How would I want to be treated? They may not be treating you like that. But how am I going to treat that individual makes a huge difference on how your day goes and how your patient's day goes. 
right? Threats. Threats can be very, very hard to um, accomplish too. The only way you're going to trust someone is, of course, if you've known them for a long time and you're you're working with them on the floor. That's great because you know what type of person they are. Um, but if not, you're going to have to work with them for a little bit to be able to trust them. Trust goes along with delegation, I mean, hand in hand. Because even though you have someone that is capable of performing a task, if you don't trust them, and you send them to go perform that task, and it hurts your patient, guess who's accountable? You. Okay? Um, you know, I think about different things. Like the vital sign sheets is one of the main things I think about. I don't know, I'm sure y'all look at vital sign sheets on the floor and everybody's breathing 12 to 16 times a minute. Their temperature's 97.8. They put out 45 milliliters a year. I mean, that, you will see that. Okay, you cannot trust someone that is not accurately writing down vital signs. You cannot trust someone who is not recording like they're supposed to. So you have to make sure that you are looking at these things. Okay, and, and I hope that whoever you work with, you will be able to gain trust in them. You know, but that doesn't always happen. So you have to reevaluate whenever those types of things go on. And you have to follow your chain of command. Okay? But trust is just not something that you're gonna you're going to um, earn on day one. I mean, people aren't gonna trust you on day one, too. So trust and respect. Make sure you treat everyone with respect. Your other healthcare professionals, they have lots of patients they're seeing. So, you know, your respiratory therapist, you come in, you listen to your patient and check their O2 fat and they need a breathing treatment. You know, yes, you're going to call your therapist, hey, can you come see this patient? When are you going to be up here? Well, they may have four or five floors, right? So that's why we always have to know how to give breathing treatment. Because it may be something that we need to do. You know, patient may need to get up and use the bathroom. But we don't know how stable they are. But it says in our doctor's order that they can get up, you know, as needed. So we may need to go get other people on the floor to help us if the physical therapist can't come right there. So you want to make sure that you do realize that you are not the only nurse with five, six patients. So conflict. So you're going to see lots of things done incorrectly. Okay. So incorrectly versus unsafe are two different things, but they can also be the same thing. But whenever it gets to be incorrect and unsafe, that's whenever you have to notify your supervisor. Or it's that you have to say, hey, did you know that actually you're supposed to do it this way? Or it can cause this? Use it as a teaching moment. Don't just attack someone, you know, hey, um, you're not doing that right or whatever. You're going to kill that person. So you need to be called out because we're here to take care of the patients. But there's a way to deal with it. Education. Talking to your supervisor, letting them know, hey, you know, this is what's going on. I've, I've talked to so-and-so, so-and-so. What else do I need to do to get this is harming a patient or can harm a patient? Also, you know, whenever you first start working, it's the, they're going to throw money at you. Oh, yeah, you want to come up here, what, 16 hours today? Or, oh, yeah, help. you can come work 12 hours tomorrow or 12 hours the next day, and I'll pay you 150 bucks an hour. And come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, well, I will tell you, you're going to get burned out big time. You have to find something else to do other than be a nurse and making money. You have to find some other type of um, hobby, you know, exercise. Swimming, fishing, I mean, painting, spend time with your family. You know, those 12 hour shifts are hard. They are hard, 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 hard on your body, hard on your family, hard on your mind. So it's not all about the money either. And for you to be able to deal with conflict, you cannot be overworked. 
So just be aware of that, okay? Yes, nursing is wonderful, it's great. You can go get a job anywhere. Anywhere around the world, you can go work as a nurse, which is fabulous. But you have to think about yourself too. Because for you to be able to be a good nurse, you have to take care of yourself, right? So that's another way. So that's your personal preparation for conflict. You have to figure out how you cope with things. You know, do you have a person you can call? Because there's going to be lots of things that happen on your shift that you feel like is your fault, you know, or I could have done better. One of the things that the reason I left the trauma unit, the surgical intensive care unit at LSU, was because I was calling up there at 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night. I'd work 7, 8, 7, 8, and then I would be thinking, okay, what about that? And I remember to do this. So it just got to the point where I, I couldn't leave it at the door. So I said, I, I got to move, you know? So you can never be afraid to move. Do I think you need to go work somewhere for six months and then move around? No, I don't. I think you need to get somewhere a year. Okay, get somewhere a year. But after that, don't ever be afraid to move. That was the best choice I have ever made is moving from there whenever I said, something's got to change, you know? And that's what I did. And I ended up going into oncology, which I never thought I would like or love. And I love it. I, I love oncology. So, you know, it's great with nursing. You can move around. But don't ever feel like you're stuck. If you're stuck and unhappy, do something different. There's no reason not to. You can't. And if you don't like it, guess what? You can do something else. That's so, great. All right, so delegation. The delegation is the process for a nurse to direct another person to perform nursing tasks and activities. So whenever you are working in a hospital taking care of five, six people, there's no way that you can do everything. Everybody's going to need to go to the bathroom at the same time. All your feeders are going to need to be fed at the same time. You know, you're going to have two people that have to be turned every two hours. So know the roles of your licensed and unlicensed personnel. Your licensed personnel are your LPN. Your unlicensed personnel are your CNA, your certified nursing assistant, or nurse tech, if you know something else they'll call them. So you have to make sure that whatever you delegate, for one, that you're able to perform that task. Step one. If you can't perform that task, you're surely not going to get somebody else to perform that task who has a lower license than you, right? Okay. The nurse remains accountable for all nursing care providers. So, I don't care if you delegate for the LPN to go put in an NG tube. Okay, well, that's within their scope of practice, right? Well, say that you go delegate that LP to go put in that NG tube, and you don't go in there behind them to make sure that it has been put in correctly, or that the verification process as an assessment say or a KUB has been done, and that patient's getting fed through that NG tube. Well, guess who's fault that is? Here. So you got somebody to help you perform the task. But you're accountable to make sure that the task was performed correctly. Okay? You are the one accountable. Please do not assign or delegate to someone to do something for your patient and go eat lunch or go eat breakfast or leave the floor. That's on your license. Okay? Your license. Um, it's important to follow the guidelines for effective delegation and know which aspects of care can never be delegated, which we're going to go through. All right, so the aspects of effective delegation, knowing when not to delegate. Okay, so how do we know when not to get delegate? Well, the first one is, is if you can't do it, you're not going to delegate it. That's step number one. If the patient has not been trained, documented trained, you cannot delegate to them. So that's whenever that trust kind of goes in there too. You know, whenever you first come on the floor and you're working with licensed or unlicensed professionals, you want to make sure that their training is all up to date. Do 
Do you have to go in there and look through their folder? No. But you can verify with your supervisor, okay, so this person has been um, adequately trained on all of the tasks that are performed on this form. Your supervisor will say yes. But guess what? You still need to make sure that you see that person do it for the first time for you. So you want to go in there and make sure, okay, so I'm getting this, I'm delegating for, um, you know, the CNA to put on a condom cap. Okay, well, for one, is it within their scope? I'm able to do that. But I need to go in there for the first time and make sure that they're putting the condom cap on right. After that, I'm, I'm, we're ready to rock and roll. We're good to go. But it has to be documented that they have been trained, handwritten documentation, and you have to see that they have the first time. You have to watch them. They have to demonstrate to you that they are competent. Um, so determining what to delegate. I have an easy way that we will learn on how to determine what to delegate to the LPNs and the CNAs. So um, we'll go through that because it, it really helps for me to kind of have acronyms to sum stuff up. You know, so well, I'll teach all that in just a second. But first thing is, is if, if you can't do it, you for sure can't delegate it. Matching the task to the person to whom is delegated. So that really helps with time management. You know, so in, for an LPN, you don't want to ask the LPN to go feed your patient or to go turn your patient every two hours because a nursing assistant can do that. You need to ask your LPN to do more of your higher level things. Okay, so that's how you effectively use your personnel is knowing what they can do and then also fitting them with that test. Supervising delegated tasks. I mean, you don't have to be in the room if you know that they're competent in doing it, but you have to be on the floor and you have to go in and check on your patient after it is done. You have to evaluate that it is done correctly. You have to evaluate that everything's working properly. So that is your responsibility to whenever you delegate a task. This here, it's, this is actually from the state board. It's a decision tree of um, certain tasks for delegation. And I mean, it's not, you can't really see it up here, but right path, right circumstance, right person, right direction and communication, right supervision and evaluation. So this decision tree, and y'all can go back and read this if you want to. It's the same thing, this is for unlicensed nursing personnel, licensed personnel. But the first thing it says is the task within the RN scope of practice. That is number one. If it is not within the, the scope of practice, no, do not do it. The problem says do not proceed. But if it says yes, then you can follow down here. Let me see if I can see this better on here. Yeah. So it says, does the agency have policy or procedures in place for the task? If y'all do not know where your policy and procedures are in your facility, you need to add that to your list of things to figure out. I still look at policy and procedures. And with the computer system, sometimes it can be crazy finding it. But that's where you need to go. You know, as a new nurse, you need to be able to access your policy and procedure of putting in an NG2. I had students last semester that they, you know, and even actually nurses that were on the floor working with us, they did not realize that if a patient had new gastric surgery or they had an esophagectomy or any type of esophageal surgery, then we can't put NG tubes down them. Well, it's clearly listed in the policy, you know, but they were doing it left and right. So for a new nurse in a facility, you need to look up all of these things, you know? Drawing blood cultures. Well, I was always taught that you had to wear the hat, the mask, the gloves, the gown. Well, policy change now to where you just have to wear the mask and the gloves. So making sure that you are looking at the policy. So does the facility even have a policy in place? Yes. What did that say? Okay, does the LPN have document training of the task? So, so does the LPN have documented 
praying the delegation of the training that the patient did well and is competent yet, proceed with delegation. So that is your decision tree that was actually developed by the state board. So let's kind of talk real quick. I have that other PowerPoint, this chapter 35, um, of the nurse practice act. Okay. I can pull that up at the end, but I will just let's just talk about that for a second. So every state has a nurse practice act. And it lists different definitions. I mean, it goes through nursing school, applying for nursing school, what we as educators have to do, what students have to do. I mean, it's very specific. For chapter 37, what I have listed in those couple of PowerPoints, it goes through specific documentation out of that Nurse Practice Act about delegation. So it just reiterates definition. But I have a slide that says, well, let's just pull it up. How about it? Okay. I don't want to end the show. Okay. All right. So chapter 37 of the Nurse Practice Act. These are the things no matter what an RN cannot delegate. All right. So let's just look through these. These cannot be delegated um, to an LPN and, of course, not an unlicensed person. Administration of investigational drugs. So any research drug, I don't care if it's oral, I don't care if it's IV, IV piggyback, a cream, that cannot be delegated to be administered to a patient. And depending where you work, you may have lots of research studies going on in your facility. So you have to be aware that you cannot delegate for anyone other than the physician to give those medications. That has to be you. Administration of cancer therapeutic drugs, so chemotherapy, immunotherapy, cannot be delegated to an LPN. All right, oral, IV, any of that. We cannot delegate for an LPN to go give these medications. I'm not saying that you're not going to see it done in a facility. And that's the difference that you're going to see there. If you pull up an LPN scope of practice, you're going to see that they can do this stuff. It really depends on the facility, but we cannot delegate for them to do it. All right? I mean, I don't know any facility that I worked in that um, LBNC did IV chemotherapy. I, I, I haven't worked in a facility that's done that. Um, I have worked in a facility where LPNs have given investigational drugs. I have. But we cannot delegate it, okay? Um, IV push medications. So IV push meds, we cannot delegate. And y'all, please don't be that person who sits there and draws up all the meds for the IV push meds and hands it off to an LPE to go give. Okay, that's on your license. You'll see that done too. Don't ever do that. IV push meds. It's listed in their scope that they can push meds, but we cannot delegate for them to push meds. Blood and blood products, so plasma, FFP, blood, accessing implanted devices, so accessing a central line, accessing a porta cap. You're the one that has to go in and access it and assess it before they you see they can use it. Okay. Um, TPN. All right. So TPN is um, total parenteral nutrition. Cannot be delegated. To an LPN. I have two acronyms, and it's the best way that I remember for delegation. So I'll go ahead, and we're going to be, it's going to be reiterated throughout this lecture, but we'll go ahead and go over it. So, PASET is what cannot be delegated to an LPN. Okay? So, I'll tell you what each letter stands for. P is planning, so plan of care. The LPN cannot. Delegate, I mean, the RA cannot delegate to the LPN to develop the patient's plan of care. Assessment is A. The initial assessment cannot be delegated. 
And that is initial assessment is key in there. C for collaboration. So we're collaborating with other medical professionals. E, evaluation within the nursing process, evaluating the task, evaluating whatever is going on. C is teaching. We have to do the initial teaching. After the initial teaching has been done, then it can be delegated. So that is what you cannot delegate to the LPM. Okay. So what you can delegate to an unlicensed personnel. So a CNA, a nurse tech would be your vapor. So you can delegate vital, so vital signs. You can delegate ambulation. You can delegate positioning. You can delegate eating. And you can delegate recording. So recording, battle signs, eyes and nose. So that is what you can delegate. So the LPN, but we talked about what you um, cannot delegate. It's the set, vapor is what you can. Y'all need to memorize that. Y'all need to be able to write that out on each one of your tests. Yes. Uh, on the test one, what was the key again? Evaluation. Like the evaluation of a task. Okay. Or yeah, evaluation of any type of any plan of care that has been developed, evaluating how it went. Okay. So like whenever you're doing your nursing care plan and you list your goals and you evaluate it, <laughs> you have to be the one to evaluate that. All right. Okay. So it goes back. These are your five rights. It's more specific. It's exactly whatever I have in the other PowerPoint, but we can we can look through them because why not? So the right task is this task within your scope of practice to delegate to the LPN or the unlicensed assistant. Is this a task only the RN can do? Make sure the task doesn't require critical thinking or assessment, collaborating, planning, evaluation, or teaching. Well, there is your cassette right there, right? That should help you. And y'all, this will help you in answering questions too. Have questions in practice and on English. Right circumstance. Look at what is going on with the patient. Are they stable or unstable? You're never going to delegate anything if you have an unstable patient. That's kind of common sense. If you have a patient who's vital signs or you think that they're having a um, like hypertensive crisis or any type of acute situation, you're not going to say, hey, will you go in there and get that patient's vital signs for me? Let me know what they are. Please don't do that, okay? Please. You want to go in and those are the patients you want to see. Also assess the current workload of the person you are delegating to. That's where that respect comes in there. Okay? And y'all, I'm going to just tell you something. I would get real, real mad if whenever I was working and I would see this nursing assistant running their tail off and the dang nurse is sitting at the nurse's station on their phone, talking mess, eating, and you've got this person that's running their butt off. Well, that's why you end up losing good people. Okay, because you overwork them. You know, no, they're not getting as paid as much as you. Let me tell you something, they're working their tails off. Now, I, I would always be the one that I'd say, all right, what do you want going? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, I'll buy your lunch today. Like, things like that, because finding good help is hard. So you want to make sure that you assess the workload of the patient. You know, yes, it may be a little more taxing for you. You might be up and moving all day long. You'll get your steps in. But you don't want to overload somebody. You know, if it gets to the point where it's unsafe, you know, you need to tell your manager. And a good manager will come out and help. Um, are they stretched thin? And it would be too much to get too much on a person to ask them to do the task. Don't delegate it. You know, that's that respect factor in that. The right person. 
Are you asking a person who has demonstrated competency in this task? Which means they know how to complete the task because they have done it before and is within their scope of practice deemed by your state and facilities protocol. And we've already talked about the importance of looking at protocol and policy. If the person has never done the task before, you will either you will need to either do it yourself or be right there with them as they do it. And that's what I would recommend. Hey, come on, let's go do this. You know, and then you can see that they've done it. They know how to do it. And then it is on them. It is their responsibility. It's within their scope. Okay. Remember, even though they can technically do the task, you should always make sure they are competent to do it because you still are accountable for that task. We always remain accountable. And y'all, I have, have worked with so many nurses that are like, I'm not able to do it myself. Okay, well, that can actually cause unsafe things too, because unsafe situations, because you're not able to do everything yourself 100%. You know, so you, you can't have that mindset. You just have to have fine people who you can trust that can perform the task um, competently. Right direction communication. Are you explaining it very clear way how to perform this task or what to expect to report to you? So you want to make sure you're very clear and concise. Right? Hey, on Mr. So-and-so in room 42, I need you to go put a Foley catheter in this patient. You know, we need to use a 16 French Foley catheter. Okay. He is allergic to betadine, so we need to use what is the core prep, whatever else we're using now, the like. Um, you need to make sure that you get adequate urine output, and I need you to tell me how much urine you got back after you put the Foley in. If you do see that you meet any resistance at all, you need to stop and come get me. Okay? So you want to make sure you're very, very clear on what's going on. Right supervision. Always follow up with evaluating and supervising how the task was completed and ensure it was performed correctly. And do not forget about it. Remember, you are accountable for the task. You are accountable. Okay, um, let's take a break. But these five rights, um, this is all after, all from chapter 37, all the nurse rights test. I just kind of tweaked it a little bit, you know. But for testing purposes, I'm never going to ask you the definition of delegation. And I have some questions that we'll go through at the end of this lecture to kind of show you what those questions will look like. But it's going to be more of you've got six different tasks. Which one can you delegate to the LPN? Which one can you delegate to the CNA? You know, so those it'll be those types of questions which we'll do. Okay, so 10 minutes. So for prioritization, that is a huge part of what you are doing every day as a nurse. Who the heck am I going to go see first? What task am I going to accomplish first? I've got all this stuff that I need to be doing, and I don't know what I need to do first. I just, I, I don't, I don't know. So these are going to be some different ways that will help you and guide you with that. I would love for you to be able to say that this is black and white. It's not. There's lots of gray area in there. Um, but really when it boils down to it is how stable the patients are. That's what's going to make the biggest determination on how you prioritize your care. Yes. You're playing that. Oh, I thought I fixed this and I didn't. This, I'm telling y'all, I've done, this has been like this for three, probably four semesters. And I, I thought that I've fixed it. And then for some reason, it's just one of those things that likes to mess with me. Whatever. What else you got? Okay. So objectives. So what we're going to be looking at, what is prioritization and the concepts surrounding it? We're going to compare and contrast ways to base priority of patient care and utilize principles of prioritization to determine which patient needs to be seen first. What is prioritization? It's the organization of activities in which they have to be performed. <laughs> So this, and this is going to play through, I know, it's fine, and I'll go back to where I was. We've got to talk about this for a minute. 
So as third level nursing students, you have to be able to go in and fully take care of the patient. And you have to know how to do that. You have to know that you have to be checking your doctor's orders every two hours to see if there's anything new that has been put up. You have to be able to go in and know, okay, that this wound care can be performed at the end of shift over this antibiotic um, administration. So you have to be competent enough to be able to read your doctor's order. Step one. And y'all, I'm really going to be pushing that this semester. Okay? Y'all are going to be going in. You know, the computer situation can be iffy in the clinical side sometimes. But the way for you to prioritize is to know to read it first, right? Let me read to see what I have to do today. So what my patient's diet is 10 Are they supposed to be on IV fluids? Right? Um, do I need to change out lines today? Do I need to change out dressings today? Can the patient get up and ambulate? Can, does the patient need help to the bathroom? What kind of medications are given? Does this one have meds do at 8? Does this one have meds do at 9? Well, then I'm going to get meds at 8 on this patient first before I get meds for this patient at 9. So there's lots of different activities that you have to determine an order that you're going to do it. But first of all, you have to figure out what activities there are. Right? And the way you do that is assessing your patient and looking in the chart. Okay. So whenever you are thinking about prioritization, you know, there's priority on answering test questions. Because I do have a lot of those. Who are you going to see first? Right? Usually it's whoever's the sickest. Right? Whoever's in the most acute situation. Whoever's the most unstable. When it comes to test questions, when it comes to inflex questions, right? It works, it's a different ballgame because you're not going to have unstable patients every day, right? So there's different ways to prioritize, different reasons to prioritize, but you've got testing purposes, which go hand in hand with real life care, but whenever you're working in the hospital, you don't always have a patient who can't breathe or the patient whose blood pressure is in the dirt. So that would be more of a prioritizing task for stable patients. Okay, so you've got different ways to prioritize. You've got your ABCs, which is always going to be your number one. Okay, ABCs, trends versus isolated findings, and I've got slides for each one of these. An actual situation over a potential problem. Systemic before local. Acute before chronic. Maslow's is in everything when it comes to prioritization. Because you've got your physiological, psychosocial. Time management, that's going to be more for your stable patients. And then infection control issues. So these are the ones that we're going to go through. I did post a um, that the, the extra API help. So the one that talks about the prioritization, I think it's the last one, maybe maybe the last one, I don't remember. But it goes through the specifically too. So it'd be a good way to kind of reiterate to you about these things. So there is something, you know, with ATI that you can use. All right, so ABCs. So ABCs is going to be your first and foremost way um, when you're prioritizing. So when you go in and get reports, and you have a patient who they're saying is breathing 40 times a minute. Okay, well, I mean, you're going to go see them first, right? So you've got airways, breathing, circulation, disability. So your airway is, does the patient have an open airway? Are they straight? Are they plugged off? Um, are they not able to handle the head? Um, are they aspirating? Do they have any kind of laryngeal edema? So your airway is, is their airway open, right? If it's not open, they either are going to have to be intubated or trace. So that's going to be a code situation, right? Are they, what, are they having um, signs of strider? So that's probably one of the worst, right? Airway compromise. 
pose down. Breathing. So are they to get Right? Are they breathing too slow? You know, maybe they've only got four or five breaths per minute because they've had too much pain medicine. What if they're on two steps? How are they oxygenating? <coughs> what about the negative pressure in the chest? When you listen to lung sound, do you not hear air moving in the bottom left side over here? Does the patient say he has fluid accumulation, has a pleural effusion, has a new thorax, maybe he has rib fractures? So how adequately are they breathing? If they're not breathing adequately, you're going to end up having an airway problem. This is, I don't know. Make this ABC. I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I mean, y'all have. Does it move for y'all? No. Well, I don't have an impairment. I know that. Okay, we'll do it. Half the class, you can come up here. <laughs> okay, so that goes along with your breathing. Okay? And it's not just listening to lung sounds and respiratory rate. It can be that the patient got too much pain medicine or they're an overdose patient. You know, um, trauma patient that comes in and they're not they're not moving air like they're supposed to because they've got either an air pocket, glass lung, something. That's your breathing. C is circulation. So patient has a low blood pressure. Okay, patient is having signs of chest pain. Maybe they're having a heart attack. Maybe they're having a stroke. All of that goes along with circulation. D is disability. When you think about disability, you need to think about neuro status. Okay? Are they having a decrease in LOC, decrease in level of consciousness? You know, maybe the patient was awake and alert um, during the night. And then you get in report that the patient's even a little more lethargic. That's a disability. That's a decrease in LAC. It could be the patient's taking pain medicine, right? Or they're asleep. But that is the for disability. So airway, breathing, circulation, disability. If you can make it past that, you're gonna have a pretty dang good day, I would say. Because that's how that's gonna be your number one. So in test questions, if it's safe. That a patient is having difficulty breathing, please sit back. <laughs> okay. If it states that a patient is blood pressure is 60 over 40, please sit back. Okay. I mean, so it's you have to think about it like that because if, if you do not act upon A, B, C, or D, the patient can be dead. That's how you have to look at it. All right, let me move back to make sure. Okay. So your A, B, C, or D. Okay, so trends versus isolated findings. So trends, uh, this is something that I I think about different stories, and this is a true story, not the test question. That I had a patient who came out of the operating room, and I did not connect the patient directly to the monitor. So it looked like the patient was flat lined, dead, right? Like, you know, the pork, the pulse ox, the patient. 98% pulse off, tells me the heart rate. But I'm hollering down the hall from my position, right? Because I didn't check for the pulse. I just saw on the monitor that the patient's heart rate is zero. I'm thinking they're dead, okay? Well, you gotta think about things like that, right? I mean, <laughs> an isolated finding, you need to assess your patient. An isolated finding with vital signs could be that your blood pressure cuff is not put on correctly. Or it could be that, you know what? The patient was sleeping and the nursing assistant went in there and other than putting the normal size cuff um, above the arm, they put it on the wrist or put it on the leg. You know, so you have to make sure that if you do see a change in vital signs, then you assess your patient, right? But don't freak out right off the bat. Go in and make sure that for one, the number is correct that you're doing the assessment, you're looking at the patient, you're doing, you know, is it the right test size? You check it manually before you freak out. Um, pain scale. So pain scale can be a big deal because you may have a patient who has not been having to have pain medicine administered. Maybe they're post-op or something. And really, they haven't been getting any pain medicine. And then all of a sudden, they start complaining about this really, really bad pain or something. We'll just say in their calf. 
right, complaining of calf pain. Well, that is an isolated finding, but that is something that you need to go assess because we know that that could be a DVT, right? So just because they haven't been asking for pain medicine, you know, you need to look at this, okay, all of a sudden they're calling out for pain 10 out of 10, they're having, you know, chest pain or abdominal pain or leg pain. Okay, that's priority. You need to go see that, right? You need to go see that patient over somebody who's been getting pain medicine every four hours. You need to go see that situation first. Um, also, too, like your 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 vascular patients, those are big deal patients when it comes to pain because we know with like arterial compromise, you end up having with the ischemia, it hurts, right? I mean, that ischemic pain is very, very painful. So you need to be making sure that you pay attention to that pain. Level of consciousness. So level of consciousness, especially first thing in the morning, it could be an isolated finding, but you know, some people just not morning people. And I'm sure in clinical, y'all, we all gone in and woken many of people up and they're not real happy with you, but you know, you're not at a hotel. Yeah, you're at the hospital. So sorry, sir. Hey, sir, my name is Cheryl. I'll be taking care of you today. I just want to come in and check on you. All right, I'll be back in about 30 minutes to do your assessment. Is there anything I can get for you right now? So you don't realize how much assessment goes into just doing that. I mean, you're assessing their LOT. If they're awake alert enough to talk to you, their vital signs are pretty good. They're breathing okay. You can sit there and count their respirations while they're sleeping. You know, but LOT, you come in and it's hard to stimulate somebody and you didn't get that report. You know, you do want to make sure you do your assessment. I mean, you're going to be checking their pupils, making sure they're equal and reactive. They're not going to be real happy with you, but sorry, sir, you should have woken up whenever I stimulated <laughs> um, But also, did they give you sleeping medication? They may not have got any sleep during the night either. You know, it's, it's a definite myth that you get rest in the hospital. I mean, it's just people are coming in. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, and all of it's say by it just is what it is. So you want to make sure that you do look to see kind of what the situation is and what medication they've gotten too. You know, because it could just be that. Um, your level of consciousness, your Glasgow coma scale, um, that's something I will teach y'all how to perform this semester. But it's really are they awake alert and oriented? You know, do they know where they are, their name, what's going on in their place? Can they move all extremity? equally okay and can you understand what they're saying so that really is the best way to do a neuro assessment and i think the best what i'll do is on the first day of clinical we're going to talk about gps because that's really what how you need to assess a patient neurologically so when it comes to trends versus isolated findings your level of consciousness goes along with your gps that's pretty much hand in hand okay so whenever we are talking about it in this lecture so it's just is the patient awake and alert and they work? Are they weaker on one side? You know, whenever you got them this morning when you went in and got them to raise their arms up and squeeze, you come back a little bit later and they're weaker on that hand. And you're like, wait a minute. You know, you're weaker on this hand. Okay, let me see, what about your feet? You know, because it could be that the patient is having a little stroke or so those are things that you need to be paying attention to. And so that's why there's been two different things with level of consciousness and GCS. It has to do more with motor strength. Acute versus a potential problem. So and this is pretty straightforward. You have a patient who comes in who is actively bleeding or actively throwing up. And then you have a patient who comes in who feels just dehydrated because they've been throwing up at home, but they're not throwing up now. You know, you're going to see the actual problem over the potential problem. So, you know, that, that's really what that means. So, and, and that kind of backs up to who is more stable. You know, if you've got ABCs involved, you'll be doing your ABCs. But, you know, you'll have two patients that come in that are diabetic patients, and one of them is in DKA, and the other one's blood pressure 600 because they're awake. Right? So, you know, that, that's what the difference is. You want to go with who is the sickest out of the two. 
Systemic versus local, also called life over limb. So if you have a patient who comes in and broke their arm, okay, you're going to see a patient who is a new post-op over a patient who broke their arm or a new admit um, that you really don't know what's going on. So if it's a patient who is just having a, you know, I go broken arm, broken shoulder, or maybe some sort of infection of the hand or something like that over a patient who is vital time or O2 sat is declined, you're definitely going to see your patient, your systemic patient, over your localized problem. Okay. And, you know, some of these, like I said, are very, very just straightforward. Acute versus chronic. So you have an acute problem over a chronic problem. Um, that's like your CHF patient. You know, you have two CHF patients come in and one of them has got shortness of breath. One of them, O2 sat a little bit lower, is on oxygen. You know, they both have CHF. They both got edema in the leg. But you've got one of them who is having that kind of more to your ABC. You know, so those are the things that, you know, you would go see that problem over a chronic CHF patient. And y'all stop me if y'all have any questions. There's your Maslow's, y'all, but the physiological and the psychosocial, sometimes those go hand in hand. You know, and just because that you're not going to work in psych, you're going to deal with psych regardless. Psych patients are everywhere. You know, and you'll be able to identify them. So your physiological, it's going to be more of your ABCs, okay? Airway, breathing, circulation, um, things to, I mean, things that you have to have to be able to survive. Your safety is kind of your fight or flight. You know, so do, does the patient feel safe in their environment? And then really all of that backs up to your, your psychosocial stuff more here. And backs up all the way to here. And this is just more of your the, the actual potential. Is the patient um what's the word for it? Is the patient happy with themselves? You know, but I don't know many people that totally are okay with everything on Maslow's. I mean, maybe in a perfect world. But the main things that we are focused on when it comes to life or death are the physiological, but we always have to think about psychosocial too. Psychosocial can be whatever situation is going on with the patient. Like maybe they have stage four cancer, okay, and they are not wanting treatment or they are receiving chemotherapy, but they are questioning why. I mean, things like that, those go hand in hand because if they don't take treatment, or sometimes even if they do take treatment, it can affect them physiologically. So, Psych is always involved. I mean, always, always, always. I mean, it's, it's that, I think that's one of the saddest things about nursing sometimes is because you're doing the best you can to help them. But it's like the psychosocial part is harder to treat than the physical part. So, you know, I mean, we can put oxygen on them. You know, we can give them medicine to bring their blood pressure up and bring their blood pressure down. We can give them pain medication. You know, but if you've got somebody who is bipolar or depressed or, you know, yes, there's medications for that, but that's harder to treat a lot of times than physical problems. So. Okay. Time management. See, you knew I wanted to do this. All right. So time management. So this is, and this is a lot of what y'all are going to be doing is work. Um, and I've got some pretty good notes that I've written out on my PowerPoint. But these are for stable patients. Okay? So for stable patients, these are going to be different ways to perform tasks. So say you come in and you get reports, and really there's not much going on. It's so and so, so and so. Um, you know, he's got a heat form for a colonoscopy at 11 o'clock today. Um, this is so and so. He's going to the operating room at six. You know, we'll say 7:30 because that's when we're coming on. So they haven't called yet, but they're coming to get in soon. Um, this lady's probably going to be discharged today. 
This one is Trey. You know, the she's fine. She's going to be discharged today. You know, just because you're Trey doesn't mean you're unstable, right? I mean, that, that takes a little bit to get used to. Okay. So immediately, like, what needs to be done now? And with stable conditions, you know, it's not, it's not life or death. Okay, so you will have different um, views on some of this stuff. Okay, I and mean, I get that. That's okay. That's just part of our personality. But immediately, so like our patient that was going to the operating room. So the patient is going to the operating room, right? Well, you know they're going to the operating room first thing in the morning, and everybody else is stable. Well, I'm going to go see them first, right? I'm going to go in and say, hey, you know, let's make sure we're ready for the OR. We've got our OR checklist. You know, hey, you haven't had anything to eat or drink. Consents are on the chart. You know, we've got our, um, our IV antibiotics ready to go for the OR. So that needs to be done, like, immediately. Um, you know, and, and immediately when it comes to time management, is going to be more of your procedural thing. Is the doctor at the bedside waiting to put a chest tube in or putting a central line in? You know, we can't put those off. We can't put off the patient going to the cath lab. Like, we got to do that now, right? Okay, so within a specific time frame. So, um, like our patient who is getting the colonoscopy at 11. Well, we know that they're going to be calling for the patient about 11. So we know that we have to get, if you look at our orders, in anything that needs to be done, we need to have that done before 11 o'clock, right? Um, maybe your wound care is scheduled for 9 o'clock in the morning, right? But it says, okay, to give with that. So we know that we're going to do that, but it does not have to be done right now. It has to be done within a specific time frame. Um, by the end of shift. So there's a lot of things that need to be done by the end of shift. So um, changing out central line dressing, doing trait care, um, giving the patient a bath. I mean, you uh, well, I said that I don't know. I mean, calculating them, but you're watching those all the time. But yeah, so documenting that type of stuff, documenting plan of care. But y'all, even though it has to be done by end of shift, if you have a patient who will just say, like you said, I don't know, does not put down any urine, well, we're not going to wait till the end of shift to do anything about that, right? Or if you have a patient who needs, you know, their central line dressing change, but it's soiled and nasty, we're not going to wait. To the end of shift to do that or trait care but you go in there and it is just caked with secretions and all disgusting hey well i mean I, that may not be something i need to do right now but i'm not going to wait until the end of the day to do that because i can end up with an airway compromise for that so you have to just you have to assess what the task is and is it is how the patient how the patient is presenting when it comes to that task. But there are a lot of things that um, you have to perform by end of shift. You know, um, oral care, that's within a specific time frame. Oral care on the floor um, in, in my facility has to be done usually every four to six hours. So, you know, that goes within a specific time frame. You're not going to wait till the end of shift to brush the patient's teeth. You know, if the patient's sitting in stool, you're not going to wait till the end of shift to bathe them. You know, if their their dressing that you on their sacrum is disgusting and falling off, and there's stool in it, you're going to make sure that you handle that as quick as possible. Because if not, you're going to end up having an infected patient, and then you're going to have to go back to your agencies at that point because they're going to be stuck. So you got to use common sense on that. Um, least amount of time to complete, that one can be a little difficult to do because, yeah, so the patient just needs a cup of water, you can go in and give them a cup of water, but sometimes it's a setup and you go in there and they're like, oh, by the way, I need you to do this and this and this and this and this. 
you know, but that's why you have to be able to say, okay, well, this is not something, either for, I can delegate this, or this is not something that is important. I have to do this before this. And just as long as you remain respectful with your patients, okay, then you'll be fine. You have to tell patients no sometimes. You know, I'm ready to get up and take a shower now. Okay, well, sir, you know, I will be there as soon as I can. If they get mad, they get mad. I mean, you know, I mean, you can delegate that to someone else to help you. That can delegate to really comes into play. But um, the least amount of time to complete, I think the definition of it is, if you have a patient who needs wound care over a patient who needs pain medication, you can go in and give them their pain medication and then go do the wound care. So when it comes to definition and English purposes, that that's what it means. You can go in and perform a task quickly or handing off, you know, water, giving them a spray. That way they're not consistently on the call like. But um, in practice, the least amount of time to complete, least amount of time can turn into a lot of conflict. Infection control issues. So y'all, you know, we do our best at, you know, wearing our PPE. We really do. And if y'all don't ever know what PPE you're supposed to be wearing, y'all know there's a sign outside the door that tells you what you're supposed to put on. Yeah. Okay, making sure of that. So we do our best. We clean our machines. We clean our stethoscopes. We follow our policy. There's just no possible way that we're never going to, um, I mean, it's just, it, it can, it's easy to pass up and you just don't mean to. We do, we do our best, but for us to say that we're never going to contaminate, I mean, that's just not going to happen. So, the best thing for you to do is see the most infected patient last. The problem with that is, is sometimes your most infectious patients are your sickest patients. Mm -hmm. So if you have a patient who is really, really sick, you're not going to say, sir, we'll see you last, okay? If you're infected, we'll go see everybody else, okay? You can't do that because the patient will die, you know? But in a stable environment, you do want to go see the patient who has MRSA last or VRE last or COVID last. And you want to be able to, um, you know, put all their activities together. So be prepared when you go in there. You know, so you go in there your first time to do your assessment, you want to make sure you've got caps on you, you've got balls on you, you've got flush on you, you know. And that way when you go in, you can say, okay, so what other, and you look at your chart, or when you can group together the activity. So you're minimizing contamination to yourself, which means you're minimizing contamination to other patients. Okay? But if they are unstable, you have to go see them first. You know? And you know, there's gonna be different times that you are gonna see people go in and out of patients' rooms without PPE on, and that just makes them very, very mad. They're like, well, I'm not gonna touch the patient. I don't care. Okay? It tells you to put it on. You put it on. Get in the habit of putting it on. You know, I mean, whenever PPE got really, really short there for a while, so we would put, you know, unless it was soil, we put the gowns on, go into the patient's room, and then before we leave, we would hang them up. So, you know, in, in our rooms, we don't have like the any room, most rooms. So we would hang them up. That way, when I go back in, I put my gown back on. So there was ways to figure it out. Now you put them on, but you do have to make sure that you are grouping together your activities. Because if not, you're going to be going down to Central to get down all day long, and then your your manager is going to get mad and fired because you're costing too much money. So make sure everybody wears PPE. If you do see someone that does not is not wearing PPE, especially as a staff nurse. You know, I know as a student, it could be a little more difficult and you need to say something to me. But as a staff nurse, hey, hey, well, please put that dirty gown on before you go in there. I mean, you know, there, there's a way to do it. You know, this, you don't want to bring, you can throw it off. You don't want to bring that home to your family. I mean, of course, you don't want to give it to everybody else, but I guess we're really not worried about that. You don't want to bring that home to your family or you don't want that. How much sick time you got I mean, you know, so there's a way to do it. But you do want to make sure that you do it directly. Because if you don't, and you've got a 
patient maybe who has C. diff and they're rolling in and out of there, well, guess what? You're going to come back the next day, you're going to have five patients who have C. diff, and you're going to be running your tail off, and these people are going to be sick. So be aware of that. Okay, all right, so we got a couple questions we're going to do. Okay, we're going to start down here. Okay, sorry. You're going to read the question. And D5, yeah, D5 and a half. Normal failing. Okay, so if we look at this patient and we're thinking about stability of this patient, what do we need to be concerned about first? O2 sat. So B for breathing, right? So D O2 sat. I do want to talk a little bit 